You are listening to the Religica Theo Lab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. This is Michael Reed Trice with the Religica Theo Lab in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. And today I'm in conversation with Professor Catherine Puncelon Manlimos, who is the inaugural Vice President for Mission Integration at Seattle University, having just returned to the university after being at another university for the last three years. Dr. Puncelon Manlimos is also affiliated with the Department for Theology and Religious Studies and was the inaugural director at Seattle University of the Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture. Thank you so much, Dr. Punzalan Manlimos, for joining us today in this conversation about mission integration and how we understand these in the vital life of a Jesuit university in the world today. Thank you for the invitation, Michael. So there are so many questions we could have about how we understand the nature of Jesuit universities that we may understand as a specific kind of gift to the world today, to a gift to our communities, let's say, or to the region or the country, perhaps at a time where people are feeling a little worn on the tail end of a pandemic that's not not over yet, but that has kind of bleached us a bit, that's been a source of exhaustion. How do you see, maybe just begin there, How do you see, as you've begun this time and this new role as vice president, how do you see a Jesuit university as a gift in society and culture and in the context in which you're beginning today? Yeah, you know, when I think about the distinct ways that Jesuit institutions of higher learning are called today, a couple of things come to mind. One is that they're always called to be attentive to the context in which they offer their education. I think attention to context is critical. And quite frankly, one of the characteristics of our times in our particular context is divisiveness, right? Sort of an inability to hear one another and and see the good in one another. And these institutions, these Jesuit institutions, are founded and really guided by the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, of Loyola. And I'm always brought back to the beginning of the spiritual exercises in the, before the exercises themselves, Ignatius has these series of annotations, sort of for the person giving a retreat. And there's this annotation, annotation 22, called the presupposition. Mm. Sort of in short form, the presupposition invites us to always give the person we're listening to the benefit of the doubt, Mm -hmm. right? Like at bottom, if you go through the presupposition, the invitation is to try to hear the good in what another person is saying. And that's sort of your posture. And if for some reason somebody says something and, and you're having a difficult time hearing the good in it, the invitation is to clarify with the other person. You know, you could be misunderstanding what the other person is actually trying to say because your assumption is there must be some good there. And if in the person's clarification, you realize, oh, there's something really problematic about what the person is saying, even in terms of their intention, the invitation then is to move towards correcting them out of love. Not so that you're right, but because you desire the good of the other person as well, right? So this is foundational in the spirituality that undergirds the institution. So what would it look like to be an institution of higher learning that educates its students to begin with that kind of granting the other, right? The benefit of the doubt, desiring to see the good that the other is offering, And that's the posture you take. And those are the kinds of people you send out into the world, those who seek the good in one another offers the world. And when that fails, desiring to bring about change out of a desire of love for the other, as opposed to being the person that's constant, you know, because I'm right and you're wrong, which is, I think, how things tend to play out. And right now, we just assume the other who's different from us is wrong. You're reminding me of, you know, in our leadership program at the Albert School of Business and Economics, I imagine at the law school here at this Jesuit university, I I wonder if it's also true in other Jesuit universities, Often we'll teach this phrase, bounded ethicality, the sense mm. that we, we come with all of us, certain kinds of biases or presuppositions, you know, prejudices that do the opposite of what you just described. But if we could do that, that sense of giving one another the benefit of the doubt and in a shout out culture, which is so contrary to what you described, is there something about what you're suggesting seems to me that's also, it's countercultural in that regard. 
It's、mm. really suggesting. Isn't that something that we would imagine one day that love, or the expression of love, or the expression of giving someone an opportunity and giving them the benefit a benefit of the doubt, might even be countercultural? Isn't it crazy? But again, if you think about it, this is a Catholic university, right? And really foundational to Catholic thought and kind of this orientation is the assumption of the goodness of all things. Not that things aren't broken. Not that things are not messy. Not that that evil isn't present in the world. But at bottom, the starting point is the assumption of the good,、huh. right? If we just go to that for a moment, when we think of the starting point, there's a lot of conversation around this term、uh, progressive. You know, what's at the core, let's say, of a Jesuit university experience? There's lots of discussion around, you know, progressive or innovative or the good or you know, Jesuit or Catholic. And you know, you're talking about what's at the core of those things. Are those words also at the core, and how would you align them in terms of being a progressive or Jesuit or innovative university? Where does that show up? So I have to say, as you mentioned earlier, I'm coming back after being away from the university for about three years now, and the vision statement of the institution that speaks about Seattle University being one of the most innovative, progressive Jesuit Catholic universities in the globe. Was surprising to me because this is a new way that we've articulated our vision, and I think when we look at those four terms. Innovative, progressive on the one hand, Jesuit Catholic on the other. We probably often assume those are terms in tension, right? Because when we think of innovative, progressive, you think of this adaptiveness to the reality of of one's time and trying to bring about change that is responsive to that. And often, when we think Jesuit Catholic, we think tradition, and we think stasis, and we probably think something that's fossilized, which is a misunderstanding of the two latter terms, right? When I think of, for example, the Catholicism, I think of Vatican II, and in the Second Vatican Council, I think specifically of Gaudium et Spes, which speaks about the Church in the modern world. Right? And it talks about paying attention to the signs of the times. That's the invitation to be responsive to the signs of the times. When I think about Jesuits over the almost 500 year history that they have as a religious order, this is a re- religious order that's been adaptive to time and place consistently, right? And so the innovative and progressive aren't contrary to Jesuit Catholic, but really I think is emphasizing something that that those two terms, Jesuit Catholic, are also inviting sort of attentiveness to context. And responding to the needs of that context, right? The challenges of that context. As I said earlier, our presupposition is the good. Underlying this is a presupposition of a God of love who desires the good of God's creation. But the reality is, this world that we live in is broken, and so the invitation is to help bring about healing. And I think that the innovative, progressive speaks to that, right? Responding to that brokenness in a way that's adaptive and attentive to it. So, when you look in your new role as vice president, and you look across the university, given what you've just said, I mean, it's really inspiring to hold those in a healthy tension, and you can see these different departments and offices, centers, places where that mission is kind of spinning out into the world, wherever that may be. What do you see? What inspires you? What opportunities or or ideas come to your mind, or even what hope is kind of generative for you? As you think about what's happening now and and what you're imagining for the future, so as you ask that question, the images that were coming to me were images of faculty colleagues in different schools and colleges with different disciplinary expertise, with different knowledge and research that look deeply at the reality of our world. Yeah, and again, integral to the kind of education we offer as a Jesuit Catholic institution is interdisciplinarity. And bringing all of this knowledge and all of this research together to be responsive to the reality we're living in, interdisciplinary is integral. There's no way to understand any one problem in our world today that doesn't require multiple disciplines、yeah. to see different angles of it. And bringing together diverse folks to help us understand the complexity of all of the problems that we see in our world. Right? It's not just the disciplinary expertise and the diversity in that, but the diversity of Persons that make up our community that give us insight into what these problems really mean, right, and how these problems really affect the lives of people. So I, I think of our deep commitment, for example, around inclusive excellence, our, our you know lift SU, our strategic plan around sort of bringing all these different voices together, bringing all of these. I guess we're thinking about faculty and staff and administrators who help us, not only in terms of how we see the work that our institution needs to be doing as an institution, but how it's responding to the world that it's a part of. 
our emphasis on diversity is really the pathway to the kind of excellence that we seek to actually be responsive to the reality we're living in. Now, do you want to attribute that to the innovative progressive or to the Jesuit Catholic? I say yes. Right. Great. Yeah. And it seems to me it's As you're talking about this, just to underscore, it's not about checking boxes. Like, as I hear what you're saying, wisdom shows up, innovation shows up, systems change, and capacity for moving the dial in responding to major societal challenges shows up when we integrate that level of discipline, faculty, when we bring cultural and unique, diverse perspectives to the table that necessarily have to be in conversation for us to move to the next best place. And this is implied in your use of the term perspective, right? Bringing diverse lived experiences. I would be remiss as the VP for mission integration to not name explicitly bringing spirituality as part of this. I love that you use the word wisdom, Mm -hmm. right? Because we're not just about knowledge. We're not just about professional skills, but we're about discernment. Yeah. We're about being able to reflect on these realities and getting at the depth. And again, we're about these diverse voices, which would be useless unless we're actually listening to them and attending to them and hearing them and allowing them to shape our own thinking. But I think there's an element of spirituality that's involved in that as well. I think spirituality is key. It's, it's For me, it's what leads to the deep listening. Can we talk about where that's coming from? I mean, in terms of you mentioned the arc of a 500 year history. Mm-hmm. We can go all the way back, and I'd just invite you to go back as far as as you'd like in this. We could even go back to the kind of convalescent uh, bed where Ignatius has been injured because he's been, his leg has been fractured by a cannonball, which has created a physical trauma, probably a psychological trauma, and he is immobilized. And as I understand, it's in that space base of immobilization that from the injury and the trauma physically, he finds himself spiritually and psychologically and existentially moving into the world again in a very new way. How would you describe that experience? Is that kind of getting us, is that adequate to how we understand what you meant by spiritual as a starting point? Where would you go? So let's focus on the the story of Ignatius and hope we get to, I think, where your question is asking me to go. I'll add another thing to the way you were describing what happened to Ignatius, right? And that often just summarized as his cannonball moment where his legs are shattered and he's, he's forced into convalescence for month upon month upon month. His dreams were shattered. Yeah. Right? So his self knowledge, his self image is totally shattered because here was this man who had all of these great sort of dreams about a a life of valor in like courtly life, right? Who was vain about his appearance and just, just, I have this image of Ignatius who's about town and he's just has this air about him and he's going to have a life of success. He's having a life of success until this moment, right? I mean, his leg was shattered in part because he was such a charismatic leader that he was able to convince these outnumbered troops, right, to just continue fighting in this battle in Pamplona. And all of that is gone. He's physically deformed. His aspirations for court are probably shattered. He doesn't know what to do with himself. I'm imagining Ignatius uh, in this bed, but what, nine months or so, right, that he's doing this? No Twitter, no Netflix, right? No internet. Not a lot of books even to kind of allow his daydreaming to happen. We're told in his story that he had two books that were available to him, The Life of the Saints and The Life of Christ, The Lives of the Saints and The Life of Christ. And he's got nothing but himself, these two books, and his imagination, right? And as you say, it's in this moment that he discover. well, he discovers who he is. Maybe he discovers this deeper calling, this deeper desire in him, this possibilities of longing in him that hadn't existed until he encountered these two particular books. And then he learns to listen deeply to himself in the midst of this, right? He, this is where he learns discernment. This is where he learns the difference between daydreaming about winning a woman's hand and daydreaming about doing these things that the saints that he was reading about were, were doing or did in their lives. And he begins to see the qualitative difference of what that means to him, how that's moving within him and how one 
One might offer joy, but it's fleeting, but the other offers this kind of lingering joy, Mm -hmm. right? And he begins to see, I guess that begins to lead us to what I'm sort of suggesting around spirituality, this kind of deeper listening and attending both to oneself and to others, to oneself and the world that one is moving in and paying close attention to that qualitative difference between, let's say, my daughter, this is wisdom from my daughter, you're walking into the mall and buying that one thing that's kind of calling out to you in that moment. And it feels really good for the moment you go home and it's gone. Right. Right. That kind of of immediate thrills out. Right. It's gone. And that moment where you participate in something meaningful to you, whether it's working with a community or, or maybe it's walking a trail, right, in this beautiful place that we live in. And there's this lingering sense of joy in that encounter that's different. And then when we think about the kind of education, now let's bring this back to the kind of education we were offering at, at a Jesuit institution. How exciting is it to imagine that we are able to invite our students to that kind of depth of reflection and self-awareness and that kind of depth of attention, not only to other people, but to themselves, Right. That allows them then to experience whether it's texts, whether it's moments with a student organization, whether it's just sitting with somebody over a meal, they begin to qualitatively experience something different or experience something qualitatively different. Sorry. Yeah, no, I. One of the things that interests me about discernment is that often it's referred to, I think, in an academic setting in a way that doesn't appeal to the history as you just were. Mm. So it can feel somewhat kind of linear or flat, but when it's understood as a part of a deeper spiritual exercise that begins with the personal experience of trauma that goes back five centuries, Mm. it tells me something about how discernment as a process of self-discovery that's kind of baked into an educational system It makes more sense to me now because it's no wonder that in Jesuit universities we talk about the education of the whole person because that level of discernment would necessarily include your whole being as it did for Ignatius. There's no part of you that would escape that kind of self-assessment, self-discovery, which would invoke that kind of joy, sure, but also... There's a kind of, that's a hard-fought joy. That's a lot of time for processing, getting to a place of gratitude, and integrating all of that. And I wonder, as the vice president for mission integration, what's the relationship, do you think, between that cannonball experience and how you think about integration in Jesuit universities today? Oh, interesting. My mind just went in a place I did not expect it to go. Let's follow that. Yeah, no, I'm thoroughly fascinated by that question because I realize that we are living in a bit of a cannonball moment in higher education broadly, in Catholic higher education more specifically, and in Jesuit higher education in particular. There's sort of this survival mode that sometimes we feel. People are always talking about the demographic cliff where there'll be a lot fewer students. Mm -hmm. And then we have the pandemic that seems to to have sped up and heightened a lot of the anxiety around the demise, if you will, or the decline of higher education. So there's, there feels like there's, it's a bit of a cannonball moment, right? And one can frenetically try to bring about sort of this, this very artificial way of healing, if you will, of, of trying to address the problems that we have. But when I think about Ignatius and integration and the way he was able to draw from sources that were unfamiliar to him, in this case, really sources of his own faith tradition, yeah. right, honestly, and sort of learned how to Listen, again, to listen deeply, both to himself, but to the sources, right, that he was able to reimagine himself. And these sources gave him a new way of reimagining himself, right? This new way of being like the saints as opposed to being like that successful knight in court, right? He ended up having a totally different vision of himself. So if, in a sense, if there's a shattering, there's a rebuilding. If there's a shattering of dreams, there's a reintegration of dreams. I was always struck by the fact that, you know, people would talk about how Ignatius had a particular personality. He was an ambitious man, right? And how that amb- ambition was shattered and yet was rebuilt into something radically different. 
I don't know if you'd use this term ambition, but think of what he was able to do after he rebuilt himself, if we can kind of use the direction you're pushing, to helping bring to birth something far greater than anything he could have imagined prior, right? The society of Jesus, that's going to be a global religious order, but also that's going to have this profound impact in higher education over these 470 years, which therefore means it has a profound impact on the globe, right? Some of the leaders in different nations of the globe are Jesuit educated. So when you think about that shattering and that rebuilding that happened to Ignatius, I don't know that Ignatius could have imagined the impact he was going to have have on the world. Oh, I know he couldn't have imagined the impact that he's going to have around the globe over centuries. There was a dream that was shattered. And as he, he kind of got to know himself differently, again, through the help of these texts that helped him to imagine differently, something radically new. Was... I think that's it's so helpful to hear you talk about that because, as you mentioned, Ignatius didn't know this about himself. And so there's Ignatius, the human being, as you noted earlier, the kind of convalescent human being back there, pre-Ignatius the founder of the Jesuit order and everything that's happened to date. And it's the one before all of this that's so much more interesting in so many ways, because I think as human beings, we identify with that person. And you're, you know, referencing the shattering and reintegration. I think that's what I find most effective in Jesuit universities as well, because the honesty and the integrity of that human life shows up, not the myth of the human life, just the integrity of that one human life. And so what can the listener or any human life have in terms of impact on the other side of those kinds of experiences where self-discovery is leading oneself back out into the world like this? I, One of our you know cousin universities in this country have a statue of Ignatius looking down an urban street. And I like that very much because there's always this sense that that the university is looking out into the world. I'm just fascinated because as we were describing what happened to Ignatius and this idea that he was able to reintegrate and reimagine himself in a way that he wasn't prior to that experience of convalescing and being stuck with only these two books to read, right? Yeah. I find myself thinking about what the role of our our education and the education we offer is for our students, right? Not just the example of this Ignatius who's able to do this work of reintegrating after this shattering, which I feel like a lot of our young people are really experiencing right now, this sense of shattering. Could you say more about that? You know, if we think about our, our young people, if we think about what they say about millennials and Gen Z and almost a sense of hopelessness, yeah. given the world that they're living in, yeah. a world characterized by pandemic, by climate change, by gun violence. I mean, you know, yeah. there's just such a shattering for them. But I think what our education is inviting us to offer is for it to be those books, those two texts that Ignatius had, right? These two things that will, or this reality of education, that'll give students different ways of imagining right, for themselves and for their world. I hope that's the kind of education we offer. I think that's the kind of education we're invited to offer. I think that's what education generally is. But we add to that the layer of imagination is important for us, Mm. right? Because this is what Ignatius taught us, the power of the imagination to imagine something different and to be able to step out into the world to to begin to actualize that which we imagine. How important is it for us to have in our vision statement, I believe, this connection between imagine and shape in the way. It's so much implied in what you're saying, but I know we mean that specifically, don't we? Is it across fields or is it, it's more than just a kind of philosophical add-on, right? We mean, how would you describe the importance of that? Sorry, I almost like you're probably seeing my mouth hanging open because for me, there's just, those are just so intimately connected. It's our imagination that allows us I guess to have before us this new world, this different world that we desire. And isn't that the, if you will, the map, the plan, the hope that then defines how we move in the world, the shape, right, that you're talking about, the action piece. I know that the Ignatian term we often use is imagination, but Pope Francis also uses the term dream, yeah. right? I always invite people to dream, dream that which you desire to see. And allow that to guide how you're going to move in the world, right? 
And so it is what the imagination is capable of that I think is going to dictate how we're going to be able to move in, in shaping the world, right? When you meet with faculty and the board of trustees or colleagues, friends, students, and staff, and you ask them to dream, is there a pattern or is there something you're starting to see that you recognize? This is starting to show up for me. I'm starting to see that as a university, there's something interesting about how we dream together. And maybe it's something like we dream with a certain level of hope or kind of tenacity, or, or maybe it's there's a kind of underlying courage or something else. How would you, is there something unique about how we dream in the heritage of the Jesuit tradition? I'm smiling right now because I'm always cautious about claiming uniqueness, especially because I am so steeped in the Jesuit Ignatian world that I, I'd hate to claim something, yeah. right, just for us. But I can tell I can describe this world rather than Great. trying to say anything else about what exists outside of I think it is hopeful. Yeah. Because it asks us also to attend to our desires, the deep desires. Again, that sense of there is something that wants to be born in and through us, right? At least that's, again, there's a very Catholic theology in the back of even that statement for me, right? That there, there's something that we're called to do in this world. And so I think the way we imagine and we dream invites the surfacing of that so that we can name that which we have and we are invited to give to the world, right? Whether it's gift, it's talent, it's aspiration, it's imagination, or it's just a desire to do something good and meaningful, right? However, that's going to manifest. But I don't know if this is making sense. Or it's just I just have this sense. And again, I am very much shaped by this education. And so if there is hopefulness in me, if there is imagination for shaping and building something better in me, I think it is because of the education that I received, which is the kind of education that I hope we can offer our students, right? And it's one that, again, pays attention to what each of us individually has to bring, pays attention to the gifts that others bring, pays attention to how these can be brought together to make our world better. But notice the assumption there is each of us has something good to contribute. But critical to being able to do that is creating this space for each one of us to be able to surface it for ourselves and then to be able to offer it. Thank you, Professor Catherine Puntalan Manlimos, Vice President for Mission Integration at Seattle University, for your time. Thank you, Michael. You've been listening to the Religica Theolab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. To learn more about the center's work and for resources to be used in local communities, visit us at seattleu.edu slash the center.